Hi, my name is Guy Wallace, and in this packed video short, we're going to cover the knowledge and skill categories, an important aspect of the analysis methodologies of the PAC processes for training and development, learning, and knowledge management. PAC is an acronym, performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven, training and development of any blend. Once we understand in the analysis of the PAC processes what the target audiences are to be focused on, once we've established in the PAC analysis methodologies the target audience and who we're going to be focused on primarily, secondarily, and tertiary who's not in the box, and we understand the performance requirements in terms of the outputs produced and the key measures, the key tasks that are performed, who's doing what role responsibility wise, what the typical gaps are and their causes, we can go to the third component of analysis in the PAC processes, and that's to systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. So I use 17 categories of knowledge and skills. And you'll see on this chart here, there's the zero category performance requirements because I've had groups of analysis teams say to me over the years, well, you also have to include telling them what the performance is. And I got tired of telling everybody, well, we've already got that captured on all the performance model charts that we just generated here. Now we're understanding the enabling knowledge and skills. But of course, they're right. You do need to tell the learner what the performance is, what the outputs and measures are, what the tasks are, what the, what the roles and responsibilities are, and all of that. So I started including the zero category performance requirements, and you'll see that it's already captured on the performance model. But if you were thinking about what we're going to generate next as a bill of materials, the parts list, you know, if you got a swing set and you have to put it together, it tells you all the tubing, it tells you all the chains, it tells you all the metal screws, and all of those kinds of things. So those, that's the parts list. Well, this is the categories of the parts list for the instruction and information that's required to enable performance. So we're going to systematically derive this. So we need to know, yes, what the performance requirements are, what are the company policies, procedures, practices, and guidelines that we must comply with. Are there any? Policy 17.24.3 is important for something. Um, and so we need to understand not just what that policy is, but how it affects our performance. Yes, we have a policy, this is what it states, and this is what you do when you're doing this performance, and you make it performance relevant, not just generic on the policy, because that's no good to anybody unless the policy is such that it crystal clearly identifies the implications for task performance. Same thing with laws, regulations, codes, and agreements. Now I have the company policies and procedures go first because if you're in a highly regulated industry, you have all the policies, procedures, practices, and guidelines that'll keep you square with the laws, regulations, codes, agreements, and contracts, which are externally um, imposed rules that you must comply with. The third category, industry standards. You may or may not be adhering to industry standards. Sometimes you want to go renegade and do something different than what the industry is doing and how they've standardized on things. There's a risk in that, but you know it is what it is, and you're just doing the analysis, not making that decision. Are there internal organizations and resources, a corporate library, a corporate print shop, a corporate this or that, where they make copies of your DVDs or they control the LMS? And there's external organizations and resources. There's the plumbers down the street that we have a contract with their national organization. So when our plumbing breaks, we call them and not your brother-in-law. Um, there's marketplace knowledge of the competitors, the competitive products, the uh, in, environment, the uh, regulatory environment, the coming regulations, the, the tenor and tone of that environment that I might need to understand to do my task performance appropriately. There's product and service knowledge, our product and services. What products and services do we render, and is that necessary for me to know? There's also the process knowledge. Do we have an addy like process to produce training? Do we have a new product development process that generates our new products? Do we have a distribution and delivery process in place? These are things that the enterprise has probably named 
maybe formally, maybe not so formally, but that's what you've got going after here. What are the processes that someone needs to know when they're doing that performance that we articulated earlier? And perhaps it's already apparent in the way you've captured the performance data. The ninth category, this is the everybody's least favorite, is all the records, reports, documents, and forms. So what's all the paperwork, whether it's online or a real piece of paper, that people need to complete as part of the process? Perhaps that's evident in the task articulation of the performance model. Perhaps it's not. It depends on what level you were operating in when you captured the performance data. Tools, equipment, machinery, computer systems, software, and hardware, which is a special category of tools, equipment, and machinery that I found necessary to break out and do differently beginning in the 1980s. There are also personal and interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills are the things where I'm interacting with others, and personal skills could include project planning, where I can do that all by myself, and I don't need to be interrelating with somebody else so there's a bunch of personal development kinds of skills that can be captured and interpersonal. If the category of the target audience includes managers and supervisors, category number 14 is appropriate, but perhaps not. Not all of these categories are used in every analysis effort. As always, it depends. There's also business knowledge and skills. Think of this as kind of having an MBA. Masters of Business Administration degree where you understand business and finances and all those kinds of things here. So what kind of business acumen does one need to have, knowledge and skill wise? Do I need to be able to calculate ROI or RONA or some other business metric? So that's where this gets captured. Now these last two categories are kind of two different kinds of catch-alls. Sometimes I have professional and technical skills. If I'm in the instructional design business, I have ISD or ID, instructional design kinds of professional and technical skills. I may have to have platform delivery skills and facilitation skills. Things like that uh, can be listed under that category. But perhaps um, I am a engineer and I have my own engineering kinds of professional and technical skills. But let's say in the context of who we're analyzing here, some of those engineers were brought into the training organization, the learning organization, so that they could then become analysts and designers and instructors. Well, all of a sudden, they have now a functional specific set of skills that they need to learn that aren't their homeroom professional and technical skills. So the engineer in category 16 would have had all sorts of engineering kinds of things there, but now they find themselves in the materials organization or in the instructional design organization or in some IT business analyst group. They're outside of their home room. Now are there functional specific skills that they need because they're out of their home room and they're in some other function? Maybe it's permanent, maybe it's temporary, part of a rotational job assignment, but there are things now that they need to learn about the function that they find themselves in that that are another set, another type of professional and technical skills. So again, categories 16 and 17 are kind of a catch-all. They're not always appropriate for every analysis because target audiences are either somewhat homogeneous and they all are engineers with an engineering degree and they don't need to worry about that. Oh, maybe perhaps we've taken some instructional designers and moved them into engineering to become engineers and they don't even know AC, DC, electrical theory and we're going to have to train them. This is the manner in which I capture that and avoid having gaps in my analysis data because as you'll learn later on in the video series, that's really important not to have gaps, not to have overlaps as you go into the design methods. I hope this video and this video series is helpful to you in your practice of performance-based training and development, learning and knowledge management. I've been practicing, publishing, and presenting on these topics since the early 1980s. My more recent book, Six Pack, covers all of this in great detail.